we'll get right into here where it says in verse 1, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now, of course, that's a rhetorical question. You know, he's not really looking for it. He's not wondering. He's not pondering as to, you know, why that is. He's making a point here and saying that basically it's pointless. He's saying, why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? And really, if you could kind of give a, you know, overarching theme to this chapter, it might be, you know, if you can allow me a little bit of the liberty to say resistance is futile. You know, that's, that's kind of what he's saying here. You know, he's saying, look, it's pointless for the heathen to rage. It's pointless for people to imagine a vain thing. And he goes on and gets into it. He says, look, the kings of the earth set themselves together. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, you know, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their courts from us. Now, of course, the anointed there that he's talking about is referring to Christ. And the, you see this over in Acts chapter number 4. In Acts chapter number 4, I'll just read to you. In verse 23, it says, and being let go, they, Peter and John, went down to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Let, Lord, uh, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that them in there is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, so he's about to quote the same psalm right here in Acts chapter 4, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? <laughs> imagine vain things. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, and against his Christ. So you can see how they changed it there in Acts. They're quoting the same psalm, but instead of saying against the Lord and against his anointed, they're saying against the Lord and against his Christ, because now they're understanding the anointed of God is Christ, the Messiah. So you can see that this is, ref this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the primary application here. And he said, but I want to draw attention to the plurality also that's in this context here. If you look at verse 3, it says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So when he's talking about again, taking, uh, you know, taking counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, you know, we understand the primary application is he's talking about Christ. You know, the kings of the earth set themselves together. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his Christ, against his anointed, which is exactly what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is prophetic, prophetic in the sense that, you know, Pilate, Herod, you know, the, the rulers of the earth, uh, they took counsel against him. The kings of the earth set themselves against him. The rulers, the Pharisees, they, they also took counsel against uh, the Lord and against his Christ, against his anointed. But notice also in verse 3, again, that it says, let us break their bands asunder. So there's a secondary application or meaning that we can get out of this tonight. And he's saying, you know, they cast away their bands, they cast away their cords from us. And what they're saying here is that they want to you know, they don't want to be restricted. And that's how the world perceives Christianity. I mean, they're saying, look, let, we want to break their bands. We want to cast away their cords from us. That's how they perceive Christianity as a whole. They think, oh, it's a very restrictive religion. They'll say, I, people will put off getting saved, saying, well, you know, if I get saved, then, I might have, then I'm, it's going to be expected of me that I live a certain way. Now, we understand that you don't have to live a certain way to get saved, but we also do understand that there is a thing what's called proper Christian conduct. That there is a, you know, it should be expected of you if you claim the name of Christ that you live your life in a certain manner. That you don't do certain things, that you do do other things, that you have a good testimony. And the world looks at that and they say, oh, that's restrictive. Oh, it's a band that we want to break asunder. It's a cord that we want to cast away from us. And that's not how we should ever feel about the Lord's commandments. The Bible says his commandments are not grievous. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, it should be a delight unto us to do the Lord's commandments. We should take pleasure in them. We should seek to do them. They should be, uh, you know, the, the, what we desire to do with our life is to please God and not have this attitude that the world has that says, oh, you're just trying to ruin all my fun. But the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. The Christian life's not the hard life. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's, a, it's a, you know, a tiptoe through the tulips. It has its trials. It has its tribulations that it come with it. But you know what? It doesn't have a lot of the, the hardships that the life, a life of sin has. A life of sin has far more uh, you know, negative consequences that come with it. And none of the pleasure, you know, besides the pleasure of sin, obviously. But it has none of, none of the peace, none of the grace, none of the good things that come with the Christian life. 
You know, there's something to be said about the Christian, living a good, godly Christian life. Having a clear conscience. That's a great feeling. Not having to look over your shoulder and wonder if someone's going to find out about this or that that you're up to. That you just know that you're living, you're living for the Lord. That's a very liberating feeling. So you could, but you could see how they look at it. This is how the world, this is how the kings of the earth, the rulers that take counsel against the Lord, this is how they view Christianity. This is how they view God. That he's just some fuddy-duddy trying to stomp out their fun. And notice there again the plurality. It says they, re, they say that it's their bands, it's their courts. So they, not only do they reject Christ, but they also reject them that follow him. Okay? Which is me and you. They, re, they reject not only Christ, but also us. See, they can't get to God, but they can get to me and you. And a lot of times when people are lashing out at us, and they don't even know who we are, what they're, who they're really lashing out at is the Lord. And again, the whole point of this chapter is that this rebellion that people express towards the Lord and against his anointed, both he and, and those that follow him, is vain. That rebellion, that, that casting off the courts, it's, it's vain. Resistance is futile. Right? And of course, the primary application again is it's futile, it's vain for the non-believer. It's for the non-believer. And it's to their own detriment to cast off the Lord, to reject God. Because ultimately, if you reject the Lord, you end up in hell. <laughs> you know? Or if you're saved, but also if you're saved, if you reject God, you end up living a very miserable life. Okay? But, <clears throat> again, the primary application would be that it's vain for these kings, these counselors, to resist God, to cast him off, to try to break his bands, to try to reject the Lord. But also, it's, also, it's, it's, it's vain for the, the believer as well. Because Christians can get the same attitude. They can just say, well, I've had enough of church, I've had enough of the Bible, I've had enough of that preacher. I just want to go satisfy the lusts of my flesh. I just want to go along with the world. Happens all the time. What did Paul say of, Demas, say of Demas? He hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. A man that was following Paul the apostle said, enough. I'm going back to the world. And Christians do this, even today. <laughs> That's why the Bible you know, implores us over and over again to not grieve the Holy Spirit. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, quench not the Spirit. Look, if, if quenching the Spirit weren't a possibility, there'd be no reason, reason to say that. He's saying, look, quench not the Spirit because it's completely possible for you as a Christian to quench the Spirit in your life. Say, well, it just seems like God's not talking to me anymore. You know, and unless you're Donald Trump... <laughs> It's almost election day. And he's up there saying, oh, the boss was telling me. You know, I'm not going to go on about it. <laughs> Apparently, he's got this direct line of communication with God now. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I so want to just do the impression. But. <laughs> but I'm saying this. When I say God's not speaking anymore, we understand what I mean by that. Not like Donald Trump would have you to think. That, he, that, that God, God looked down and said, you're the most famous person in the world. <laughs> you're the most famous person that's ever in the world. No, not me. You're the boss. There's someone more famous. Who's that? You. And I know I'm going to get criticized for that, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> there, I got it off my chest. <laughs> right? That's not what I mean. That's not what we mean when we say it, when God speaks to us, Donald. God speaks to us through his word. And it just seems like, oh, it doesn't feel like God's talking to me anymore. Well, have you been, have you been reading the book? It's kind of hard when you shut God's mouth and say, quiet. Shh. God's not talking to me. Yeah, you've got to crack the book open and read it. <clears throat> you can quench the Spirit in your life. It's possible through sin, through ignoring God, getting out of church, getting backslidden. All these things quench the Spirit. Now, it doesn't remove, away, it doesn't remove the sealing of the Spirit. The Bible says we're sealed by the Spirit under the day of our redemption, that he which hath begun a good work shall perform it. So we understand that we're going to be saved no matter what, but it's entirely possible for Christians to quench the Spirit in, God, in their life. That's why it says in Ephesians 4, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Yes, you're sealed, but in the meantime, you can grieve the Holy Spirit by taking the Holy Spirit to places He doesn't want to go. By showing Him things He doesn't want to see. Tasting things He doesn't want you tasting. So on and so forth. All these things, we let them in our life. They grieve the Holy Spirit. And often we do that when we do what? When we say, I'm, this is restrictive. 
This Christian life is holding me back. I'm missing out on something. Let me cast this cord. Let me break this band of Christian living. And you've adopted the same philosophy as the world. You've adopted the same philosophy as the kings, the rulers, the counselors, which take, you know, which, 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 you know, uh, which take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 4, we'll move along, it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And that's a very interesting verse. And you know, and I, it's something I want to kind of talk about. I thought about this a few times trying to pre maybe preach the whole sermon on this, but I, I'm glad it kind of came up because I haven't gotten around to it. But it says there that he that sitteth in the heaven shall, shall laugh. Now, of course, in the context, he's saying it's pointless, right? That's the, that's the theme of the sermon. It's pointless to resist God, believer or unbeliever. But when it says that he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh, it brings up this point that sometimes people bring up, and it's this, is that does God have a sense of humor? Now, I don't think that's what he mean, that type of laughing is what he's talking about. You know, you and I, we laugh when we find something ironic, Somebody says something witty, or maybe something, you know, very slapstick happens. You know, somebody does something silly. You know, you play spoons one night with Brother Corbin, and, and, the, and the, 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 the uh, austere veil comes down. And I, I set aside my stoic nature for a moment, right? And next thing you know, you're like, what's going on with this guy? <laughs> Who's this? All right? And we have a good laugh, right? That's, you know, that's what we think about when we're laughing. We tell jokes. Is God like that? Is that what this is talking about? Does God have a sense of humor like that? Certainly the Lord is capable of that, right? I don't, I don't think it would, just, it would be wrong. I don't think it would be something sinful. Certainly God understands humor and knows what it is. But when I read the scripture and you look at the life of Jesus, it's not a prominent characteristic. You don't really see God laughing much. You don't really see Jesus telling jokes or being silly. I'm not, and I'm not saying it's wrong to not have liberty. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You know, it's good to smile till it hurts sometimes. It's, you know, it releases endorphins. I, got, I believe God created all that. But is that how God actually is in his personality? I have a hard time seeing it. I'm not saying that I could be wrong. You know, maybe we'll get up there and he's just going to cut it up with us. I, 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 but I have a hard time seeing, him and seeing that. I don't think we'll really need laughter to bring us joy when we're in heaven. Not to say we won't have it. But I'm just saying, does God have a sense of humor? I'm, you know, the jury's still out for me. I'm kind of think, but I'm leaning towards not in the way that we would think, okay? You know, and I, and I think about this often because, you know, people, people want him to have a sense of humor like this sometimes. I feel like when people ask that question, it's because they want him to. You know, they want God, they want to think that Jesus walked around with the disciples telling jokes and things like that. I mean, he was on a pretty, pretty serious mission. I mean, he knew what he was heading into. I, I, it'd be, I'd have a hard time believing he was going into that with a sense of humor. You know, it was a very grave thing that he took on, very serious. And so sometimes, you know, I, I remember, and I probably told the story before, but when I lived in Michigan, there was this local artist. Who's heard this story before about the laughing Jesus? Have I told this? This guy who, who, was, who was locally famous in the region for his depiction of a laughing Jesus. And it was this picture from, from this guy that was supposed to be Jesus. The, 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 the depiction was inaccurate, first of all, because the guy had long hair. And 1 Corinthians 11 said it's a shame for a man to have long hair. That's just the teaching of the scripture, okay? So first of all, he's got this guy with hair down to here, throwing his head back and laughing. I mean, just wide open, you know, gaping. And it's laughing Jesus. And I remember I was... Uh, I was, a, I was a, an assistant um, of a driver's helper for UPS. You know, when they get busy during the holiday season, they hire these temporary workers to ride along with the driver and run packages to the door. And I was talking to this guy, you know, he finds out I'm going to church, I'm a Christian. He's like, oh, well, you know the, you know the laughing Jesus guy? Yeah, well, he's on my route. We're going to go deliver to his house today. I'm like, great. Because I've already been in a Baptist church. I know already, I've already been taught everything that's wrong with that artist's depiction. And I've read enough of the Bible at this point to know that God didn't just walk, Jesus didn't walk around laughing about things. I was just, it never settled right with me. So we get there, and the guy, you know, we're in this guy's garage, we're dropping off the pack. He's like, oh, I'll go with you, I know him really well. And we're talking to the guy, and he tells him, oh yeah, he goes to church. He brings up that I'm a Christian or something like that. 
And he said, and the guy goes, oh, you're Christian. Oh, do you want a copy of one of the paintings or something like that? He's trying to give me his merch for free. I was like, no, thanks. And the guy, the UPS driver, was just like, what? What do you mean you don't want that? He thought I would just be like, oh, wow, can you sign it for me? You know? And I just said, no, thank you. I was polite about it. And I got back in the van, and I told the guy why I don't agree with any of it. And, you know, sorry for if I came across as rude, but I'm just not interested in it. So that question is just never settled with me. When people start to ask, do you think Jesus told jokes and had a sense of humor? I don't. I don't think he threw his head back and laughed. <laughs> if you would go over to, go over to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Because the Bible, in fact, but we say, well, what was Jesus like? What, how does the Bible depict him? You know, beyond just the physical appearance, which we know little to nothing of, other than the fact that he didn't have long hair, what was his personality like? Well, the Bible says he was a man of sorrows, the complete opposite of what this painter would have you know, people to think. The Bible says, you're going to Ecclesiastes 7, it says in, Ecclesi in Isaiah 53, Who hath believed our report, report, and to whom is the art of the Lord revealed? For he, this is speaking of the Lord, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry, of dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So he's saying, look, it's not saying that Jesus was ugly. It's just saying that he wasn't, you know, like Saul. He wasn't head and shoulders above all the rest. There, he wasn't some exceptionally handsome individual that people would see him and go, wow, he's really something to behold. Like it says of David, that he was of a goodly countenance. Right? And it says that of other, other men in the Bible as well. Not so of the Lord. It says the opposite. There is no beauty that we should desire him. Average looking guy. Much like, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. <laughs> but it says he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I have a hard time thinking he was a guy with a sense of humor. That went around laughing. Because he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, who is the Lord Jesus sorrowful for? Who is grief is he acquainted with? His own or with ours? I say with ours. <clears throat> he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that Jesus is that way. I'm glad that that's how he was, that he was, stri he was a man of sorrows because he bore my grief. Because he carried my sorrow. You know, we should have that same attitude today. I'm not saying we have to move through life just, you know, people who don't smile or laugh or anything like that. But there ought to be a side to us that is ready to be serious when it's time to be serious. Right. To stop the joke telling and just say, look, we need, to, we need to bear some grief. We need to be sorrowful. And not for ourselves, but for others. Where we have to actually take the sorrow and grief of other peoples into account and be serious. And not make light of it. You know, and, and, and care about other people, care about their souls, care about seeing them saved and helping them. You know, our brother and sister in Christ is going through, th through something. You know, they're sorrowing. They have grief. That's not a time to make a joke. That's not a time to cut. I mean, I understand sometimes, you know, people get in situations, things happen. We make a joke to try and cheer them up. But, you know, you got to have some discernment. Sometimes a brother and sister, they don't need a laugh. They need someone to come alongside and say, I, I'm sorry. What can I do to help? Or just express, you know, that they, they feel empathy or sympathy for them. That's what Jesus did. So to answer the question, when it says, He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh, he's not laughing like, ha, huh, that's funny, good one. You know, he was not like, oh, a real knee slapper, right? That's not what he's saying. In fact, the Bible says it's better to mourn. You're there in Ecclesiastes chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And this is contrary to, to, to our culture today. People don't like this either. The Bible says it's better to, if you could choose between having to be sorrowful for the rest of your life or be just a happy-go-lucky person, the Bible says it would be better to mourn. Look at Ecclesiastes 7, 7 verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. Amen to that. I'm glad that Jesus was a man of sorrows and not this laughing Jesus that people are trying to make him into today. For by sad, the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. That's a powerful statement. You know, sometimes we go through, through things in life that make us very sad, that make us, that hurt us. 
But you know what? The Bible says that makes our heart better. It makes us better people. You know, people who never go through any hardship, everything just comes easy to them, often are real jerks. <laughs> it's true. They've never experienced any difficulty. They've never you know, been made fun of. They've never had to go through any kind of trial. They're often very, they're people who just take things for granted. They just think, oh, this is the way it is for everybody. You know, and maybe their, maybe their suffering, maybe their grief, maybe their sorrow is going to come later in life. And they'll look back and say, wow, I didn't realize this is what life is really like for a lot of people. The Bible says that sadness, the sadness of the heart, that the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Mirth is like, you know, celebration, feasting, you know, carrying on, you know, having a good time. That's, you know, having mirth. But he says the heart of the wise is the house of the morning. You know, being, going through sorrow in your life, going through trials and tribulations, that's what makes a person wise. That's what makes you able to, you know, comfort others when they go through similar things. Be able to comfort others when they go through those same tribulations. So what's he saying here in Psalms chapter 4? And you can, if you want to go over to uh, Proverbs chapter 1, <coughs> when you get there, bookmark it. So what is it saying in Psalms 2 when he says, He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. It's not talking about having a sense of humor. It's very clear that it goes on in that latter half of the verse. It says, He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. So this laughing is a type of deriding. Okay? And you know, deriding is like, a, it's a scoffing, it's a scorning. It's a, it's a making fun of, it's a mocking type of laugh. Okay, that's what the Bible says God's going to do to these people. I'll read to you from Habakkuk. It says, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. It says in verse 10, And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them, and they shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. So what is it saying here about these Chaldeans that when they come through the land, they're going to scoff at the kings, scorn them, and then they're going to deride their strongholds. They're going to look at their armament. They're going to look at their castles, their strongholds. They're going to, they're going to scoff at it. They're going to deride it. Basically what it's saying here is that their defenses, their leadership is a joke to them. They're like, this is what, you know, this is what you're going to, this is your defense. We're going to march right through that. We're going, to just, we're going to lay up dust. It's going to be nothing. They're going to scoff it. They're going to mock it. They're going to deride it. They're laughing at it. It's laughable. This is, this, that's the best you got. It's like that. You know, like when the, in the, the boxer, when he knows he's just better than the other, the other guy that he's fighting, puts his hands behind his back and sticks his chin out. He's scoffing him. Right? He's mocking at him. He'll start to talk, laugh at him. That, you know, it's this mocking type of attitude. That's what the Bible says, God's, that's the laughter he's talking about. That God is literally going to mock and scoff at these people. And you say, well, that seems kind of, kind of mean. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and if you were here this morning, you'd understand why. Because sometimes that's what people deserve. It's a just punishment for those that reject the Lord. Don't forget how this chapter started out. They took counsel against him and against his anointed they're the ones that started the fight, and God's the one who finishes it. And when he finishes it, he's, oh, you want to go with me? He, he has a laugh. He mocks. He scorns. Are you there in Proverbs chapter 1? Look at verse 20. The Bible says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. I mean, get this. He, it, it, it's, it's not as if God hasn't tried to reach mankind. He's saying, Wisdom crieth without. What's crying? No, like, Woo! He's not walking through the land crying. She's lifting up her voice. She's crying out, right? She uttereth her voice in the street. She's standing out in the middle of the street and crying out. She crieth in the chief place of the concourse, in the opening of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, how will ye love simplicity? She's crying this out. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and he refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. You can't say that God hasn't done the exact same thing. That he hasn't reached out. That he hasn't been the, the chief concourses. He has lifted up his voice in the streets. 
It's not as if God hasn't tried to reach mankind. So I don't know that God should laugh and mock and scorn at people. But it's not, he's been reaching out to them, these same people. And the problem is, is that they reject him. Then they take counsel against him. And they're going to cast off his courts. They're going to they're break his bands asunder. That's laughable. It's worthy to be mocked. The, go over to Psalms 19. Look, God's tried to reach them. It's not like God just came out of nowhere like some bully. He's reached out to them. It's like when Jesus said to, you know, he looked at Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered thee as a mother hen doth her chicks, and ye would not. They refused him first. The Bible says in Romans 10, I say, have they not heard? Yes. Verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. The gospel has gone around this world, I believe, more than once. I believe Isaiah was taking it to many, many nations. Jeremiah was taking it to many nations. The Bible tells us that. He went beyond the isles. The Bible says they have all heard. Well, modern history tells... Look, the Bible says it, friend. That their sound went to all the earth. Look at Psalms 19. Look at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, so that they were without excuse, because the, the things of God, the, the invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made. Romans 1 tells us. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. How can a person go out on a starry night and look up at those stars, all that magnificence, and just say there is no God? You can't. And if you do, you're a fool. And if you do, you deserve for God to have mock, just, just mock you for it. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone throughout all the earth. Just like it said in Romans. And their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun. Are you still in Proverbs chapter 1? Get back there if you aren't. The Bible says in Psalms 97, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. That's what the Bible says. So before you get mad at God and get angry at the preaching and say, well, I just don't think God has any right to let. And you know what? You run, you run into this out there soul winning. He's, you run into these Mormons or whoever. It says, well, I, what about people that have never heard? That's the most frustrating comment. I can't stand that. Well, I'm here telling you because you haven't heard and if you're so concerned about people on another on the other side of the world why don't you get saved today and then you can go tell them but right now i'm busy telling you and telling your neighbor and telling your neighbor's neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor's neighbor and then i and i got a whole long lot, lot of other people right here around you that haven't heard so why don't we just worry about them and then we can worry about everybody else in the world and that's going to be people's excuse for rejecting God? Well, I just don't. What about people that have never heard? Maybe you should just make you, make you all the more, for, you know, feel all the more fortunate that someone has come to you today to tell you. Because you just might be that person who never heard. And the Bible says that everybody's heard. That they, that, I mean, Jesus Christ is the most famous person in the world. Even Donald Trump agrees. There I go again. I said, no, Lord, there's someone more famous. Who's that, Donald? You, you're number one. I'm not afraid to admit it. You're the boss. I know. <laughs> All right. He's the most famous person in the world. This book is the most popular book that's ever been written. It's been, it's been put into so many different languages. Who are these people out there that have never heard? We could probably get them all, if they exist, we could probably get them all in one plane and bring them here and tell them. We could get on a plane and go find them, wherever they are. Where are you at? You're in, uh, you're in Proverbs. Look at verse 25. So God is stretching out his hand. The, you know, wisdom is crying in the street. The line has gone out into all the earth. But what, are they, how do they, how, what do they do with that? Verse 25. But he has said it not, all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. So when is wisdom here laughing at their calamity? At the very beginning? Does wisdom just walk out her front door, walk out on the street, and just start laughing at their calamity? 
No, wisdom walks out her front door, goes to the chief concourses, goes to the streets, and cries out and lifts up her voice and says, Turn you at my reproof. And that's what God has done with the world. God has gone out, and his line has gone into all the, wor all the world. And God has tried to you know, promulgate the gospel over and over and over and over again. It's told his people to preach the gospel to every creature. And when they reject it, when they laugh, when they scoff, when they set at naught all of his counsel, and they would have none of his reproof, that's when the laughing comes. Not before. That's when he laughs at their calamity. Look at, I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me. But I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? Because God's mean? Because God hates people? And God, we understand God does hate. But God's just cruel? No. Verse 29. For they hated knowledge and did choose the, not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. They rejected me. They took counsel against me and against my anointed. Now it's, now it's my turn to laugh. You know, we go and tell people, we get laughed at. <laughs> the Bible. This is how you're spending your Sunday afternoon. This is what you do on Saturday. You see those people out there knocking on doors, trying to tell people about Jesus. What a joke. But you know what? One day God's going to laugh at them. And unfortunately, for them. And justifiably so on God's behalf. Because they're going to call, but it's going to be too late. You see, God is mocking those that have refused. God is mocking those who have disregarded. God is mocking those that have despised and hated his reproofs. You know, I heard a preacher say, about, say this once, and, I, and I probably would be the same way. He said, it, you know, it's kind of, of, of course, I'm not God. But he's saying, it's a good thing I'm not God. Because if I took my only son, and I sacrificed him for the sins of the world, and I told you about it, and you didn't immediately come and get saved, I would immediately throw you into hell. Because that's, I mean, that's, that's how we would feel humanly. If I killed my, had my own son beaten, murdered, humiliated for your sake, and you rejected it, do you think I'd be as long-suffering and patient with you as God is? It's not in me. <laughs> it's not in me to do that to begin with, let alone be patient with you. But how patient is God with people? How long-suffering is God with people? How many times do they reject God, reject the Lord, get second, third, fourth chances? For God, who did the exact same thing, sacrificed his own son for the sins of the world, and they reject it. And God patiently waits, and patiently waits, and patiently waits. And then finally, they reject it long enough. They refuse, they disregard, they despise, they mock, they hate. Now it's his turn. Now it's his turn. And it comes a lot later than it would for me. I mean, for me, it would be instantaneous. <coughs> Look at verse 31. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and shall be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and he shall quiet from fear of evil. Let's just move along here in, verse, in Psalms chapter 2. It said in verse 4, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. <laughs> and look at verse 5. It says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now look, that's, that's a deep verse right there, okay? And there, there's a lot there. I wanna, I'm actually gonna, planning on preaching a whole sermon on this about the sonship of Christ and all that. That's, a, that's, a deep, that's not something I just want to blow by in a, on an expository verse-by-verse verse sermon. Just like, oh, and the internal sonship of Christ. That deserves a whole sermon. It will be coming very soon. Verse 8, he says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So again, the context of the theme of this, this whole chapter is that it's laughable that people would resist God or to think that they could take counsel against him, that they could just break his bands and cast his cords and just do away with God. Okay? Why? Because of verse 9. Look how he just makes it sound so easy. Well, God's going to laugh 
God's going to mock, and then verse 9, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. When he's talking about a potter's vessel, he's talking like a clay pot. I mean, how hard would it be to break a clay pot with a, with a rod of iron? It'd be, really, it'd be like a knife through hot butter, right? I mean, it would, you could take the smallest child in this room and give them a rod and say, go break that clay pot. They, wouldn't eat, they could just drop it on it, and it would just smash it to smithereens. God doesn't, God's using this as an, exa- he uses this analogy for a reason. He's saying that's how easy it's going to be for God to just break the heathen. That's why he's laughing. That's why he's mocking. He's saying, this is, you're, you're a joke to me. He's like those Chaldeans in the sense that when he comes through and sees their stronghold and sees their leadership, they're like, they laugh, they mock, they scoff, they deride. That's what God's doing. He's like, this is a joke. You're going to resist me, God, the Lord God Almighty? The king of kings, I'm going to just smash you like a, like a piece of clay. That's the futility of resisting, of resisting God. <clears throat> Go over to uh, Revelation, chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter, actually go to verse ni- chapter 19. Revelation 19. <laughs> the Bible says that she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This is, talk, this is all reference to Jesus Christ. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. First, uh, chapter 19, Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is who the heathen is taking on today. This is who the counselors and the kings and the rulers are, are plotting against. This is their enemy. This is who they've chosen to pick a fight with. It's like the scrawniest guy going and finding the biggest guy he can and say, I'm going I'm to take that guy on. It's a joke. Look at him. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Right there, I'm done. You got, you got eyes like fire. I'm done. You know what? I'm on your side. Is it too late to change my mind? On his, hand were, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And it wasn't his. And it's other people's blood. That's his enemies. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a, a sharp sword. And with it, that he should, with that with it, he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he shall tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his vesture and on his, na- on his thigh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. There's no resisting God. It's a losing battle. And that's why God's laughing at this. Because it's foolish. And over and over again, that rod of iron keeps bringing that back up. And it goes back to Psalms, chapter 2, where he says, he's going to take that rod of iron, meaning the, that the heathen, they're that potter's vessel. Just psh, that easy for God. What is so, what's the conclusion here? Well, look at verse 10 in Psalms chapter 2. Keep something in Revelation. Go to Psalms, back to Psalms chapter 2. He says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. He, so he's saying, look, you, knowing all this, that fighting against God is, is vain. It's futile. It's a losing battle. That he's going to smash, if you take him on, he'll smash you like a potter's vessel. You know what you ought to do then? Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges over the earth. That'd be, that, you know, that's good advice for all our politicians today. <coughs> that's a good advice for anybody. <coughs> this is good instruction for, you know, any leadership today. Our contemporary leadership you know, whoever this next president's going to be, this should be, their, this should be their, their, their policy right here. Here's a good foreign policy they need to adopt, adapt. Look, there, I heard about this king in another land who's got these flaming eyes and these many crowns and he's got a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We should probably get, you know, you know we should probably start to, uh, you know, send an ambassador to him, maybe set up an embassy, maybe entreat his favor. But they don't think any, they don't believe any of this. They're not going to be humbled enough to, 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 to be instructed and to be wise. But you know what? This is also good advice for you and me. 
with, for those that will rule and reign with Christ. Uh, obviously, the primary application tonight is for the heathen. It's a warn. This whole psalm is like a big, long warning. Okay? But it's also a good application for me and you. Are you in Revelation chapter 2? Look at verse 24. But I say unto you, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in thy attire, as many as have not this doctrine, have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put no other, upon you no other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Look at verse 26. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So who get, also gets to rule with a rod of iron? Them that overcome, right? Him that, and who is he that overcometh but him that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He hath overcome the world. We are overcomers in Christ. And we keep his works unto the end. You know, if you work in, for the Lord, if you take this life and you give it to God and you labor for him, there's a reward for that. Not only does God save you by his grace, but then he gives you opportunity to earn rewards in heaven. And part of those rewards is ruling and reigning with Christ. Okay? And the Bible's very clear about this. And, you know, it's not like we're going to rule. We're going to rule as he rules. We're going to rule in the same way that he does. We're going to enforce the same laws and, and, and commandments that he does. And with to, the, to the same power that he has. Because we're doing it in his name. We're doing it in his power. That's why it says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He's not talking about the Lord there. He's talking about the people in Thyatira. He's talking about the Christians there that overcame and kept his works unto the end. You know, we can apply it to ourselves. Say, well, what do you, you know, people, some people are satisfied with just going to heaven and, you know, your job's going to be to polish the gates or something. Which is great, you're in heaven. But then you're going to see, you're going to see, you know, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so walk by with that rod of iron, push, you know, getting some dust off. Well, I had to go take care of business. That sounds like a much cooler job, friend. Going and ruling and, you know, I mean, don't we, don't we want to see righteous judgment in the earth? Don't you want to see God's law exalted and lifted up? That's the best thing for humanity. And during the millennium, that's what people are going to do. And you know how we're going to do it? The rod of iron. It's not going to be this, you know, bipartisan, you know, committee that we're going to go be a part of and negotiate. There's not going to be this give and take. We're not going to reach across the aisle to Satan, you know, and try to work out a deal for the people. It's going to be a rod of iron. It's going to be God's way or the highway, period. <clears throat> he, shall, he, he says there, and then he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels, vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I received of my Father. So God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is sharing this power with people in heaven. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You need to hear that tonight. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a reality that people need to get a hold of. That we will rule and reign with Christ one day. And people, people hear that and they go, yeah, that's cool. I want to do that. Rod of iron. You mean that's more than just a, a cool name for a podcast? <laughs> and it is. That that's actually a reality that you could, somebody's going to get to go enforce and do? That's something you're going to carry out? Yeah. You get to reign with Christ? Yep. But did you notice the caveat there? To reign with Christ, you must suffer with him. Because that's what's happening unto the thigh tyrants, right? He's saying, look, you know, which have not known the depths of Satan. He says, I will put no other burden upon you. But that which you have, hold fast till I come. I mean, they're, they're suffering there, right? He that overcometh, meaning there's an obstacle. There's something to, look, you can't overcome something if there's nothing to overcome. There's resistance, right? Those are the ones that get to rule and reign with Christ, those that overcome. Paul said in 2 Timothy, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And we hear about the rod of iron. We hear about, the, we hear about that. We think, ah, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, if we suffer with him, if we do what he wants us to do, if we're willing to bear our cross and walk with him, yeah, then we get to reign with him. Then we get that reward. But if we deny him, he will also deny us. What does that mean, that God's going to get to heaven and say, I never knew you? No. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You say, Lord, I want to rule and reign. Yeah, but you denied me on earth. Sorry. You know, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord you know, by the skin of your teeth. You're, you know, you'll be saved as, so as by fire your works are going to be burned up. You're going to have nothing for all eternity. No works. There's going to be a lot of Christians like that 
<coughs> Why? Because they, they don't want to suffer with him. You know, and the idea here is to, to get is, th is this. Is that, you know, we're going to go through suffering. If, you know, you say, well, I'm not sure I'm willing to suffer for Christ. Yeah, but think of the trade-off. Think of reigning with Christ for a thousand years in the millennium. Think of going there and him saying, Be, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in few things. Be thou ruler over many things. You know, you suffered a little on earth. You kept my word. You did my works until the end. Good job. Now reign over whatever. Be thou over five cities. Be thou over ten cities. For what? For some momentary suffering on earth? I think that's a good trade. That's a good deal. That's why it says there in Psalms chapter 2, verse 11, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 10, Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Look, I understand that the primary caption is to the kings of this earth and to the judges of this earth, but there's a secondary application I want to make tonight. Your kings, your judges tonight. Not yet, but we will reign with him one day. So you know what? You need to be wise. You need to be wise. You, knew, you need to serve the Lord with fear. We all do. And we need to rejoice with trembling. And, it, you know, I'm just going to wrap it up here by saying this, is that wisdom begins with fear. You say, well, I want to rule and reign with Christ. You know, I want to be wise. I, I hear you, brother. I'm reading the scripture. I get it. I want to be wise now, therefore. I want to be instructed. I want to, I, I want to have wisdom. Okay, serve the Lord with fear, the Bible says, and rejoice with trembling. I mean, I don't have the time tonight to go through all the places in Scripture that say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Just oh, go read the book of Proverbs alone. Just over, over, over. God tries to get this through. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, it, you, you'd be a fool to hear this kind of preaching, to hear what you're being told tonight, to hear this message out of God's word, not my wisdom, what the Bible actually says, and to disregard it, to despise that wisdom, to despise that instruction. It'd be a very foolish thing to do with your life. Saved people who just have no desire, to, they're like, well, you know, I'm going to heaven, good enough. That's a foolish attitude. Because you're going to get there and you're going to realize, it, it's, how long are you going to be in heaven to realize, man, I, I missed out? How long are you going to be there before you realize, I could have had so much more? I could have, I could have been... That, you mean this is why it's going to be for all eternity? Yeah. You only have this life to get that, folks. That's it. One life. So don't be a fool. Don't despise that instruction. Fear the Lord and serve Him with rejo and rejoice with trembling. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 12 there, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in him. And, you know, and that's kind of, I know there's, like I said, there's dual application I'm making here tonight. You know, obviously, the primary is to the literal kings of this earth. But saved or unsaved people, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. You know, we should all have this attitude of, Kiss the sun lest be angry. You know, we, we should not want to upset God in our life. Because when his wrath is kindled but a little, I mean, that's, that's all it takes to just melt the mountains like wax. So, <laughs> you know, the, the fate of the unsaved is, is sealed. You know, it's sealed. But the outcome of the saved, their eternal reward, their standing in Christ's kingdom... That's up for grabs. That's up for grabs. I mean, we understand those that mock God, that take counsel against the anointed, that, that, that want to you know, throw him off and everything. Their fate is sealed. He's going to mock at them. He's going to laugh at them. He's going to mock when their fear cometh, when it cometh as desolation. That fate is sealed. That is their end. But as far as we're concerned, those of us that will rule and reign with Christ or be with him in heaven, you know, that is up for grabs. And how is that determined? By how you live this life. It's all based on how you live this life. How, so how are you going to live it? Are you going to live it for Christ? 
or are you going to live it for yourself? Are you going to live it for the Lord, or are you going to live it for you? Because that's the philosophy that they had back in the beginning of this chapter, isn't it? They want to cast off his cords. They want to break his bands. They don't want, they don't want that restrictive life. They don't want anyone to tell them no. And look, people need to learn that word and to tell themselves and, and accept it when people say no. And when God says no, just say okay. And go along with it. Because that's how this is all determined for us. How obedient are we to the word of God? Let's go ahead and pray.